So, hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. Today I record this on the 13th of August, the Sabbath day, because I like to do work for the Lord on the Sabbath. <laughs> no other work but that. Um, this video is called Hitler's Fight Against the Churches and it deals with chapter 9 of the book Behind the Dictators by Herbert Leo, Le Leo Herbert Lehman where we have already read quite some chapters of. Hitler's fight against the churches, the book continues. The full story of the rise of Nazi fascism has still to be written. When it appears, it will surprise most Americans to discover the part played in it by the Christian churches, Protestant as well as Catholic. <laughs> well, okay, Catholic churches are no Christian churches, but anyway. <laughs> let's leave it by the, uh, let's leave it at this <laughs> for nazi fascism was as much a product of the churches as of the state and the movement towards religious as well as political and social authoritarianism european catholic historians immediately recognized it as the fi uh, as the final act in the jesuit plan of counter reformation instituted exactly 400 years before in 1540 Americans will never fully understand the real aims and activities of the Church of Rome so long as they continue to look at Catholicism from our American point of view. On this side of the Atlantic, attention has been focused mainly on attempts of a few liberal Catholic spokesmen to integrate their church with the American way of life. These are sincere in thinking that Catholic authoritarianism can be reconciled with the liberal, tolerant principles of American democracy. But the Church of Rome has its roots in Europe. Well, actually, it has its roots in Babylon. Mystery Babylon is Rome, and Rome is Babylon. But there is metaphysic which uh, was... F there its metaphysic was first established. I'm sorry I butchered this one <laughs> because of my comment. So, but the Church of Rome has its roots in Europe. As I said, actually it has its roots in Babylon. Mystery Babylon is Rome and Rome is Babylon. There, its metaphysic was first established. It is therefore to its background and activities in Europe we must look if we want to judge what its real nature is. It is the policy determined upon beyond the Alps in Europe that directs and guides the Catholic Church even in America. Well-meaning Catholic spokesmen in the democracies are permitted to voice their liberal views, but their wishful thinking has never had any effect in real bringing the Catholic Church into line with our American democ democratic way of life. This issue has been bitterly fought out in Europe between Nazi fascism and the Christian churches. As far as Europe is concerned, the fight is ended, with victory on the side of Nazi fascism and Catholic ultramontanism. In Italy, Spain, Austria, Poland, Portugal, France and Belgium, Catholicism alone was involved. In Germany, however, both the Protestant and Catholic churches have played their respective parts. There the struggles were as bitter as and purged as bloody within the churches as within the state. They were more severe and bloody within Protestantism than Catholicism. Many more liberal Protestant leaders than Catholics were liquidated or put out of the way in concentration camps. By refusing to make any concessions to Nazism, the evangelical Protestant churches are said to have actually paved the way for the success of the German Christian movement. These German Christians, Protestant fascists, professed to consider it necessary to submit to a spiritual leader in order to free Protestantism of liberalism and rationalism. They thus became one with the Catholic fascists who, in keeping with the Catholic action crusade of Pope Pius XI, were purging every taint of liberalism and democracy out of the Catholic clergy and were bringing the Catholic Church in Germany into line with pure Vatican absolutism. Gonzaga de Reynold, 
ardent Jesuit Catholic reformer in his book L'Europe Tragique states, and I will quote that in a second, information on this Jesuit Gonzague de Reynold is to be found in French in a link that I will provide in the description box of the video here and also in German in a link that I can provide and in English there is nothing to be found in a quick search. His book L'Europe Tragique or The Tragedy of Europe is not to be found online. So I'm very sorry that Mr. Lehman cites this Jesuit here and I cannot find very much on him in uh, on the internet and certainly even not in English. I can even find can't find anything on that in English. But anyway, Gonzague de Reynold, an ardent Jesuit Catholic reformer in his book L'Europe Tragique states, quote, A real fight has been waged within Protestantism. The evangelical Protestants refused to make any concessions and established a confessional church in opposition to that set up by the state. We are on the threshold of a religious schism. These are the final repercussions of the Reformation. We are witnessing a phase of dissolution of Protestantism. Many German Protestants believe that to reject a purely religious authority like the papacy would constitute a danger to the Church and to Christianity." Unquote. Well, I personally think that when you read this paragraph between the lines you can see the evangelical movement from Vatican II from 1962 to 1965 approaching in huge steps. So maybe for a better understanding I just repeat this quote from Gonzague de Reynold here. And keep in mind he is a Jesuit using casistry and sophistry to make his point. So the quote again. A real fight has been waged within Protestantism. The evangelical Protestants refused to make any concessions and established a confessional church in opposition to that set up by the state. We are on the threshold of a religious schism. These are the final repercussions of the Reformation. We are witnessing a phase of dissolution of Protestantism. Many German Protestants believe that to reject a purely religious authority like the papacy would constitute a danger to the Church and to Christianity. Yeah, because, unquote, because Protestants are not Catholics. They always reject a purely religious authority like the papacy because when you are a true Protestant, you only accept the authority of Jesus Christ. God, the author of the Bible, Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, and your personal Savior when you accept Him as your Savior. But by reading this and now looking in 2016 back to American Protestant history, I think you can see that there is a schism, and that schism was actually founded with Vatican II. As he says in the last sentence, many German Protestants, and I guess also American, believe that to reject a purely religious authority like the papacy would constitute a danger to the Church and to Christianity. That is the belief of the Jesuits. You understand that? They put the papacy in front as a religious authority. And many German Protestants believe that to reject a purely religious authority like the papacy would constitute a danger to the Church and to Christianity. No. Accepting a purely religious authority like the papacy would constitute a danger to the real Church of Christ and to Biblical Christianity. That's the way you have to read the sentence. But anyway, have your own thoughts on that, think about it and maybe leave something in the comment here. But I think this is the way we have to read it. 
In order to understand what happened to the Catholic Church in Germany, it is necessary to go back to the time of Pope Leo XIII, well known for his unrelenting antagonism to the liberal constitution of states. In order to counteract the increasing influence of the 19th century liberalism on Catholic countries, Pope Leo XIII urged on Catholic leaders throughout the world the formation of Catholic political parties. He thought that if such Catholic parties took an active part in parliamentary politics, they would, by securing the balance of power, succeed in obtaining victory for the Church. He even hoped that these Catholic political parties would eventually obtain a large enough majority by democratic means to enable them to seize complete control of governments. What actually happened, however, was the very opposite. The Catholic parties gradually came under the influence of their liberal opponents and copied many of their ideas. Thus, in Italy, the Catholic party became the popular, liberal party, headed by the now-exiled priest Don Sturzo. In Germany, it became the liberal center party. Well, every Catholic, in what party whatsoever, pays his first allegiance to the Pope anyway. By that all parties are Catholic infiltrated and serve the Pope anyway. Just have a look at chapter 1 of Rulers of Evil by F. Tapasosi that I read on my channel and you can find that of course in the playlist Rulers of Evil. And there you will see what I mean. Counting all these Catholic laymen who are in power of every part of the civil life in the United States of America. Now the author continues, this liberal influence of Catholic parties became so great that the Holy See began to regard Catholic political trends as a grave danger which actually threatened the juridic, uh, juridical and political unity of the Church itself. These Catholic parties became infiltrated with the liberal spirit of the French Revolution of 1789. The ideas of the rights of man, of religious tolerance, of freedom of conscience, of speech and press were adopted by a great number of Catholic politicians and by many of the lower clergy. And we were already talking about the lower clergy in a previous video. So pronounced had this trend of popular Catholic politics become in the United States, for instance, that when Alfred E. Smith was nominated for the presidency in 1928, the Vatican Catholic bishops in Europe were shocked to hear that Mr. Smith has been prompted by priests to proclaim these principles to be not a mere matter of favor, as he first stated, but also a matter of innate right. This was rank heresy, and after Mr. Smith's defeat at the polls in 1928, the Vatican rebuked those who had advised the former governor of New York to proclaim doctrines so contrary to official Catholic teachings. By the end of the First World War, the Catholic political parties had begun to lose the importance which they had in the eyes of the Vatican when it first brought them into being. They became so integrated with democratic states, founded as they were on political compromise, on tolerance and the idea of equality, that it was confusing to note the alliances made by some Catholic parties with bourgeois groups and by others with the socialist groups. It had become apparent that the control of Catholic priests was being lost by the Holy See in Rome. Pope Leo XIII's plan had miscarried and had proved a boomerang against the real aims of the Church as he had proclaimed them. Catholic political action had acquired an independence that made it a menace to, rather than a docile instrument of the Vatican. Liberal Catholicism, in fact, which, to all appearance, had received its death blow by the decree of papal infallibility towards the end of the 19th century, that was at Vatican Council I in 1870, to remind you, had taken on a new lease of life by means of the very Catholic political parties which had been established and sustained by Pope Leo XIII to oppose the hated liberal constitutions of democratic states.
This is how the Vatican saw it after the First World War, and the conclusions which it drew from its observations in the matter were the first steps towards the rise of what we now call fascism. Many of the non-Jesuit religious orders in Germany, notably the Franciscans and the Benedictines, started movements which displeased the Vatican. The quote-unquote liturgical movement of the Benedictines, their attempt to establish contact with the ecumenical evangelical movement and their effort towards a reunion of all Christian churches. The attitude of the Patris Unionis, means fathers of, U of unity, who were even prepared to modify the dogmas of papal infallibility and the Immaculate Conception in order to help their work of reunion, their open and secret negotiations with groups in the Anglican Church, under the guidance of the late Cardinal Mercier. All these liberal reform movements were regarded as tainting the lower clergy and the intelligent laity with the heresy of liberalism and Protestantism. The Vatican regarded its authority as gravely menaced by it all and determined to wage relentless war against this growing liberalism in political and spiritual matters. Now, with this last sentence, of course, I have to make a little comment. You probably smell that coming, uh, as you know me. I repeat that sentence. The Vatican regarded its authority as gravely menaced by it all and determined to wage relentless war against this growing liberalism in political and spiritual matters. Now, here again, we see the agenda of the oaths of the Jesuits, where it states, quote, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls, in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poniard or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either rank, uh, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus." Unquote. Did you listen carefully? When opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war. Do we really need any more proof to see who actually runs the Vatican? Huh? It should not be surprising that Rome became disturbed at the prospect of a revival of the Lutheran Reformation. It was particularly marked in Germany. Friedrich Heiler has the following to say on this point. And uh, Friedrich Heiler, you have to know, was a professor at the University of Marburg and in his work called Im Ringen um die Kirche, means the struggle for the church. And the quote goes as follows. These recent tendencies of Catholicism have spread to a great extent in Germany. German Catholicism is in fact a particular kind of Catholicism due to the fact that it, had, that it has been subject continually, if not visibly, to the influence of the reformed churches of Christendom and has constantly absorbed certain features belonging to evangelical Christianity." Unquote. So, in other words, when you read between the lines of Friedrich Heiler, he says, the Roman Catholic Church in Germany is faced with the same 
problem the American Catholic Church faced from the start, having to develop its agenda as a minority in a, for Catholics, hostile environment, because the majority of the environment is Protestant, is Bible-believing. Just think of the Puritans you had over there in the United States of America by the time of 1776. 98% of the complete population in the 13 colonies were Protestant because they knew what they flew from when they came over from Europe to this new world. They flew from the yoke of Rome. They knew what was going on. But if not every generation over and over again fights for its freedom, it will be lost in the end. So the author continues. But the democratic states were the most powerful in the world at that time. Yeah, how come? Because they could really develop themselves without the yoke of Rome and brought out all these wonderful inventions. Look at all the inventions Americans brought out in the 19th century and the Germans brought out in the 19th century and the English brought out in the 19th century, while still being, for a very good part, Protestant and not that much under the yoke of Rome as they used to be in the Dark Ages. The Catholic political parties had become too strong to be stopped by mild protests or even by encyclical letters from Rome. Repressive action carried out by the help of authoritarian secular regimes was necessary. Thus, the two great opposing factions within the Catholic Church became locked again in a gigantic struggle. One possessing the evangelical Catholic idea deep-seated as of old in the hearts of true Christian believers, the other, the coldly imperial, sectarian and intransigent Roman party, represented by the Holy See under the domination of the Society of Jesuits. It is in the light of these facts that Hitler's, quote, campaign against the churches, unquote, must be viewed. Neither Hitler nor the Jesuits could forgive priests and bishops in Germany who sided with the cause of liberalism and democracy during the Weimar Republic. It was against them that the acts of Catholic repression were directed. Hitler and Antichrist Pope Pius XI acted in concert, meaning together, to destroy every vestige of liberalism in Germany. The one in social and political life the other in the sphere of religion. By dissolving the Catholic Center Party, the Pope removed the last obstacle to Hitler's rise to power and also deprived the Catholic people and clergy in Germany of any say-so in political matters. He had done the same for Mussolini in Italy by the dissolution of the Partito Popolare and the exiling of its priest leader Don Sturzo. By his Catholic action, he concentrated all Catholic political power in the Holy See. Thenceforth, the Vatican was free to make arbitrary concordats with the fascist dictatorships. And that concordat they signed with Germany on the 20th of July 1933 still is valid today, 2016. The lower clergy in Germany did not yield without a struggle. Many defied both Hitler and the Pope. Some priests were imprisoned. Even when the pristine ardor of Cardinal Initzer for Hitler and Nazi socialism showed signs of cooling, hostility was engineered against him. Catholic schools, mostly under the care of liberal non-Jesuit religious orders, were closed. Some heads of these anti-Jesuit religious orders were punished for attempting to save their funds by smuggling out of the country. In the press of America, this was called, quote, Hitler's persecution of the Catholic Church, unquote, and served to conceal the common purpose of Nazi socialism and ultramontane Catholicism. There were some mild protests from Rome, but no adverse action. 
even the closing of Catholic schools in Austria went almost unprotested. These were regarded by the Vatican as but a small loss compared to what was gained by the elimination of disobedient priests and their liberal views. The Nazi Vatican Concordat continues to hold and function even until today, as I already stated. With the extinction of liberal Catholicism and the imprisonment of liberal Protestant leaders, Vatican absolutism was triumphant. Of supreme satisfaction to the Jesuit Catholic faction was the knowledge of the apparent dissolution of Protestantism in Germany and the fact that the pro-Nazi Protestant German Christians were forced to realize, as Gonzague de Reynolds point out, that, quote, to reject a purely religious authority like the papacy would constitute a danger to the Church and Christianity. Unquote. And this finishes my reading of chapter 9 of the book Behind the Dictators from Leo Herbert Lehman. Thanks for watching, thanks for listening, thanks for commenting, and until next time, Jokla66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you and signing off. Bye bye.